Thank you so much, Julie, and the crew of My Jewish Learning for having me and for all the amazing work you've been doing um, now and for the last number of years for the Jewish people. Uh, it's really, really just an incredible organization, and I'm always so impressed by My Jewish Learning and all that 70 Faces Media um, brings to the Jewish people, so it's a real privilege to be here. Um, okay, so happy International uh, Women's Day, everyone. <laughs> and um, Part of this year was was developed actually as part of my thinking about um, kind of Jewish feminism and and for me in particular Orthodox feminism and and I really do sort of bring that lens to the set of texts that we are going to look at and what that set of texts is um, is the Bavli so the Talmud Bavli's stories about the maid servant of Rabbi Judah the Prince. So we're going to back up and do a little bit of work on even what those words mean. Um, so the Talmud Bavli is a code of conversational code of Jewish law uh, put together around the year 500. Um, and it, the Talmud Bavli centers around a, 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 code, a code called the Mishnah. Um, and, and what the Talmud does is it kind of like takes the Mishnah as a jumping off point for conversation. And that conversation that gets recorded within the Bavli um, it took place in a bunch of different places, both they'll record things that happened in, in Israel, they'll record conversations that happened in various study halls, Batini, Drash, and Yeshivot, in, in like what is now like Iraq, in, in Bavel, in Babylonia, and, um, and, but it's all centered around the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is this code put together by Rabbi Judah the Prince. So, Rabbi Judah the Prince is a really important person in the eyes of the Talmud. Um, he is just this like masterful teacher of Torah. Um, so important that the whole Talmud then literally like gets centered around the Mishnah, which is his code of Jewish law. And so now we're gonna talk about a woman who was, well, we'll be exploring her relationship to him. She is known as the maidservant of Rabbi Judah the Prince. Um, and one of the questions that we'll be talking about is like need servant. What did that actually entail? What kind of power did she actually have? But then for me, the question is, well, what kind of power should she have had? What kind of power could she have had? And to bring to it all these questions um, uh, that, that kind of modern women who do have access to the Beit Midrash, at least to a great degree, um, might, might ask while well, looking at her because as a woman who has been learning the Talmud Bavli since I was 12 years old, when you read the Talmud Bavli, you just see like, man, 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 um, which is obviously um, what it is, meaning that's just what the text is. And then you fall in love with this text, though. And the text is so meaningful to you. Um, and you want to kind of find yourself in it. And we often look at, at, there are other women in the Talmud named Huria or Yalta or Ima Shalom, or there's, there's maybe like a small handful of women. Um, and some of them are even learners, but I want to say that this woman in particular, um, had, you see her in the context of a learning environment. You see her exercising power within that context. You see her being learned within that context, as opposed to other characters who you see um, being powerful and learned maybe within the context of their marriage, like Guria, um, with, with the maid servant of, of Rabbi Yudah Nasi, you see a woman in the Beit Midrash environment of one of the most powerful and important rabbis of all time. Um, so that's why I'm so attracted to this woman and I, what it makes me feel like, and we'll, we'll round out to this at the end, but just to kind of say the end at the beginning, what it makes me feel like is that through these stories, the Talmud is imagining maybe me, maybe you, maybe other women who learn the, who learn the Bible. Um, it's maybe imagining what would it have been like for women to be welcomed into these Batini Drash, into these houses of study where the word of Rabbi Judah Anasi, the words of Rabbi Judah the Prince were paramount and where they could be potentially be experts. Um, okay, so that's where we're going today. How this is gonna work is I'm going to share some sources on on our screen. The, the source sheet is also been put into the chat, and um, Julie, maybe you can like periodically throw that back in there just for people who join later, because I'm going to be like off and on sharing my screens. When we're reading a text together, I'll have it on, but then there'll be some opportunity for 
conversation in the chat a little bit um, and, and some question and answers from there. Um, so if you want to just like fully be able to look back at things, make sure you open up the source sheet on your own. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at this first source together. Oh, I should also mention before we even start that the sources I'm going to bring, like you could spend an entire hour or more or like an entire day on each and every one of them. And what I'm trying to do is weave them together. So you might feel like, oh my gosh, I'm so not ready to be done with this source yet. And you would be totally right. And I'm still going to keep pushing on, but that's why you have the source sheet, okay? Okay, great. All right, here we go. Our first source is from the Bobli and Baba Mitzia 85A. And we have a teaching of Rebbe. So Rebbe, this is how you know how important he is. In the Talmud, he's just referred to, Rebbe Yehuda Nasi, Rebbe Yehuda the Prince, he's just referred to as Rebbe. He is like the rabbi, right? So that should just reinforce how important. All right, so here's the story. Rebbe says, Rebbe puts forward a position, Chavivin Yisurin, suffering is precious. And then the Talmud tells us, and then he went on to suffer for 13 years, whether through kidney stones, and scurvy, some say it was six of kidney stones and seven of scurvy, or seven of kidney stones and six of scurvy, but it doesn't matter. He said suffering is precious, and then he suffered a lot. And then Gamari goes on to tell us about that suffering and how extensive it was. So we hear about the, the house steward, the male servant, man servant, of the house of Rabbi, Ahore de Bey Rabbi, Hava Atir Yishvor Malka. He was wealthier than Shvor Malka. Okay, I, we just have to take a small aside for a second here and talk about this. Shvor Malka is a, um, a Persian, um, a Persian king, which means that this story, even though it's taking place in, it's telling you about the experience of Rabbi Judah, Judah the Prince, who was in the land of Israel who did not live in the time of King Shapur, of, of Shvor Malka. Um, the Talmud is a Bavli text, which means that even when they're telling stories about something that happened in the land of Israel, they're still going to tell you, um, they're still going to tell it to you through Babylonian language. Like, this is the same thing as saying, oh, the, male, the, the house servant of Rabbi Judah the Prince was wealthier than Bill Gates, um, which would be an American way of kind of telling this same, the same story. But it just situates you, which is like, this is the, the Bavli, a Babylonian text talking about a story in Eretz Yisrael. Um, and that's, that, that's a really important um, just perspective for us to all understand. All right, so we're talking about the, the house steward of Rabbi Judah the Prince. He was extremely wealthy, wealthier than King Shapur. And he had so many um, animals. He had so many animals at his, um, in his property. The house steward had so many animals that when he would throw food to them, they would cry and their cries could be heard for three miles. And here's what the house steward did. He would try to feed his flock at the time when Rebbe would go to the bathroom, and even so, even so, Rebbe's cries in the bathroom were so loud that they were louder than all the animals and they could be heard by seafarers, i.e. people really far away. Um, so this, it's, it's meant to be, I think, a little bit humorous, even though it's describing Rabbi Yehuda, the prince, going to the bathroom and really suffering. Um, and again, what this shows you is just like how amazing Talmudic stories are. Like, yes, even our greatest rabbis go to the bathroom, um, but it's meant to really, um, to really be describing the extensive extent of his suffering. Um, okay. And they, they say, well, the, the suffering, we're skipping a little bit here, the suffering of Rabbi Judah the Prince, they came about through a certain incident and they departed through a certain incident. And the bar is going to say, well, where did the suffering come about? What is, what, what's, what's, the, what's the incident that brought about his suffering? They were taking a calf to the slaughter. And the calf Put its, it hit its head in, in Rebbe's robes. The Kabachi and the calf was crying. And Rebbe said to the calf, No, Amrlai, Zil, Go, this is what you were made for. 
Amre and the, 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 those on high who determine which humans get suffering or not said, since he did not take pity on the calf, let suffering come unto him. Okay, that's the story by which suffering came onto Rabbi Udanasi, Rabbi Judaism. But what's the story by which his suffering left? Um, here's what it is. One day Rabbi's maidservant, our heroine, Amta Dered, Amta Dered, um, was, was sweeping her house. And Havashadeh b'nei Karkusha, some weasels or maybe like rat type things, small rodents, not 100% sure what, what this animal is, um, came along and she was about to sweep them away out of the house. Amala, Rebbe said to her, Shavkinhu, let them be. Ktiv, as it says in the verse, it says in the verse that God's tender mercies are all are, are over all his works. God's tender mercies are over all his works. And then those on high, they said in heaven, since he is compassionate, let us be compassionate to him. Okay, there is a lot to dissect here. Um, but I actually just want to focus in on two things, even though this story is like really complicated and beautiful. And we have a comment in the text about how, in the chat about how hard kidney stones are. I'm so sorry you've been through that, um, Rabbi Fair. Um, but here's what I want us to focus in on. What did you notice about the way that Rabbi Judah the Prince spoke to his maidservant? Did anyone notice anything about that? When if you if you're fortunate, just just put it into the chat. Whatever you noticed, if you're fortunate, if you're fortunate enough to have someone who cleans your home, um, and you give that person instructions about how to do it, like you might say, um, please clean this bathroom, please don't change the sheets on this bed. What's the difference between the way you give instructions <laughs> and the way Rabbi Judah the Prince gave instructions to his maid servant when he was telling her, please don't sweep away the weasels? Okay, good. He doesn't instruct her, he tells her of the Torah verse and lets her reach the conclusion. All right, so he, he does, he says, let them be, but he also brings in a Torah verse. What does that mean? What, when he brings in a Torah verse, what is he doing? What's he doing when he brings in a Torah verse? Please feel free to put your opinions into the chat. Great, Kirsten says he's teaching. He's teaching, right? She's not just, oh, some whatever person, I'll just order her around. No, he is teaching. Even when he just wants to say, sweep my house in this particular way, he's still Torah, he's still coming out. He says, Irene, he's reminding himself of the value behind his request. He's also teaching himself, right? And that's why, good, Irene, it's good to see you, by the way. Um, that's why the angels or like the heavenly court also, they, they judge him for this way of teaching, right? That he's teaching himself. God says you have to be merciful. And then they decide we're going to be merciful on him and have his suffering go away. Um, Lori Stark says he's, he's elevating. He's elevating everything, right? Exactly. Um, so Rebbe, and, and, and now that we've seen this, just one example of the way that Rebbe behaves towards his household help. Um, how do you imagine that he spoke to her, um, that he spoke to her kind of in a normal day to day, right? What, what, you know, can you imagine what he might have said to her when he wanted her to make the bed or cook certain food for Shabbat or something like that, right? You can only imagine that if this is what he has to say about sweeping, then anything that might have like some tinge of halachic relevance, like make this for me for Shabbat, she might have gotten like, a whole discourse about about the laws of Shabbat as um, as he you know as he was giving her instructions for that you can only imagine kind of in every element of their day to day existence together that his maid servant had this very intimate access to him as a teacher in all of these different elements of his life and we even saw that his manservant his house steward 
had this like incredible access to Rebbe that he knew exactly when is Rebbe going to be going to the bathroom? When is Rebbe do the friends going to be going to the bathroom? Let me like, let me try and, 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 you know, let me try and drown out his screams from the bathroom. Um, like she also probably had that level of intimate access to him and his schedule and his instruction. And he was just sort of like a font of, of teaching to her. So this first story just already shows us, and I want you to remember, by the way, the precise teaching, which is that Rebbe starts out saying, suffering is precious, and by the end he says, actually, it's really important, it's important to be merciful, that we should be merciful, okay? So we're just remembering that learning that she had here. We're gonna hold that until we get to our last source. But um, for here, what I mostly just want us to hold on to for now is, is, is what it must have been like to be in his household and this sort of intimate student relationship that she might have had with him that's probably different than the relationship that his other students, his maybe more normal students, might have had with him. All right, on to our next source. I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. All right, so this source is from the Gemara and Masachet Megillah. And here we are talking about um, here in the Mishnah, which is again, this is that this is the code that that Rebbe Yudana Seer, Rebbe right, the Prince, whose main servant is our heroine, um, that he put together. So the Mishnah says, you cannot if you leave the Megillah out of order, you have not fulfilled your obligation. We have all these different rules, um, but I just want to focus on one of these last ones, which is Kara Siugim. If you read it with Sirugin, and you'll notice that in my English, I did not translate the word Sirugin, so you're going to have to live with that mystery for just one moment. Or if you read it while you're falling asleep, it's okay, you've still fulfilled your obligation. You can't, if you are asleep, then you do not. I just want to point out as a fun halachic aside that if you, you are asleep, you cannot fulfill your obligation, but if you're just falling asleep, then it's okay. All right, here we go. Um, so the, the Gemara picks up on this last part that, that I didn't translate. So if you read it with Syrian, um, then you have fulfilled the obligation. And so just like us, that our translation does not have what Syrian is, the rabbis also did not know what Syrian was. The rabbis did not know what Syrian meant. They didn't know what the word meant until Shavuha, one day they heard La'amta Dubei Rebbe, the maid servant of the house of Rebbe. The Ka'amra Lula Rabbana, that she said to the rabbis, meaning, meaning Rebbe's students, she said to them, Tavu Aile, Piske, Piske, Labei Rebbe. She saw them going in in intervals. She saw them going in in drips and drabs into the Beit Midrash, into the study hall. And she said to them, Ad Matai Atab Nichnasin, Seugin, Seugin. How long are you going to go in by Sirugin? Okay, so the rabbis didn't know what the word meant. She saw them going in in piske piske, in, in drips and drafts, in intervals. And she says to them, How long are you going to go in by Sirugin? All right, so I want us to reflect for a moment on what we just saw. First of all, what does Sirugin mean? <laughs> Um, feel free to throw it into the chat. What does Sirigin mean? She, she, they didn't know what it meant, and she said she saw them going in in drips and drabs, in intervals, and then she says, how long are you going to be going in in Sirigin? Good. So Rabbi Feyer says she's teaching not by giving instruction, but by using the words in question so that they will come to understand. Okay, good, Rabbi Feyer, but last time when we saw someone doing that, who was the instruction giver? It was her teacher. It wasn't her. Last time it was Rabbi Judah the Prince, and here it's her doing it to his students. Great. The word here again in the context of reading Megillah would mean I'll read a little bit now, and then I'll take a break and have some kiddush, and then I'll read a little bit later. Um, so that, that would be, that's what the word means. And she sees them going in to, yeah, having a spiel between chapters, great. So she sees them going in two students now, and then two students later, and she, and she says to them, how long are you going in the Syrian? They didn't know what it was. They heard her use it in context, which is, again, how Rebbe taught her. 
And now she is teaching his students in that same way. Um, there is definitely a, um, a feminist read to be brought to this because you sort of wonder, she could have taught them more directly. She could have said to them, hello, you don't know what this word means? Let me tell you what the word means. I know what the word means. And would that have worked? <laughs> what do you think? You can just give a hand, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Well, how would that have gone over for her? I'm seeing some thumbs down, lots of thumbs down, right? You have the maid servant and you have Rabbanan, you have the rabbis, and she goes over and says, oh, you guys have a question? I know the answer. That wouldn't have worked, right? So there's a certain sadness there. There's a sense they don't know things, she knows. And then on the one hand, there's the read of, she's a master educator. She learned how to teach from their teacher and she's paying it forward as a master educator, giving them this kind of experiential knowledge. And they'll really, and once they figure it out from her kind of clues and using it in context, they're gonna really internalize what the word means. And that's really important, right? Because that's how the Torah gets preserved by them knowing what the words mean and what the halacha is. So that's her as master educator. But then there's another read, which you can hold both at the same time, which is, yes, she's a master educator, but she also had to teach this way because she was a woman. And, you, and, she, had, and, and she had to teach this way, and she had to be a little bit discreet. And instead of just letting her Torah flow and come out, she had to kind of make it as if they just figured it out on their own or they, they, you know, she couldn't just like be all up in their face about it. And there's a certain sadness in that, well, maybe there's a lot she didn't get the chance to teach because she had to teach it in this roundabout way and because she had to teach it while she was on the outside. The third perspective or the fourth perspective, I don't even remember what we're up to by now that I want to bring to this is uh, to this little story that we just saw is what is her rule? What did you notice? On the one hand, she's not allowed to go up to them and be like, oh, you guys were wondering about what this word means. Let me tell you. On the other hand, what is she allowed to do? They're not going into the beat midrash fast enough. They're dilly-dallying. And she's yelling at them. So on the one hand, she's like not in the beat midrash and she's not formally teaching them. But she is in some ways also the gabai. You know, she's the one being like, all right, time for mincha, like everyone is. <laughs> Um, and so she is playing this kind of powerful role, even while she's not necessarily allowed to teach frontally and while she's outside of the Beit Midrash, but she still knows what the questions are from the Beit Midrash. So, you know, she sort of like has this insidery role, even while she's an outsider. She has the answers to the questions, but she's not allowed to teach them. And she learned how to teach from Rabbi Yudanasi from a region of the Prince, who is her boss. Okay, we're gonna, um, I, oh, I'll show you one last thing about this and then we're gonna move on to our next word. Um, okay, so I just want, want you to see here that we have, um, that we have this, we have this teaching about Sirugim that, that gets, um, that, that clearly by the time we have this teaching about Sirugim, this brighter that comes down, it shows us that she was right about what it meant. So. We have, we have a caveat to, if you read the Megillah, Megillah the Book of Esther with Sirugin, then it works, like then it's, that, that's allowed. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, you have this writer that says, you can only stop for a certain amount of time. So Iyam Shaha Kadeli Morat Kula, Pozer Lelosh. If you, if your spiel, let's say, in between the chapters lasted long enough that you could have read it again from the beginning, then you, or sorry, that you could have finished it, then you have to read it again from the beginning. It adds a time cap onto your permitted breaks, which then shows us exactly what Sirugin means, which is what she taught it to. So um, her teaching, theoretically, at least was successful. All right, next source, we're in Moed Hatan 17a. Um, this is a long and complicated and super important story for so many reasons. And you'll see why the minute we start reading it. Um, and we're actually not reading it for the reason that it's normally taught. So uh, again, as we read it, you're going to be like, hold up, I have so many thoughts. My brain is exploding. That's what this is that kind of Gemara. Um, and like, uh, I'm just apologizing in advance. You'll have to go back and learn it with a Chavrusa in your own time. Um, and I'm going to say a lot of it outside also so that we can get all the way to da, 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 so the bolded part where we have about our, our particular heroine. 
All right, so we have, we'll start at the, end of the beginning. How we talk about Mary Bonnet, that was Samuel Shulane. We have a certain rabbi who had a bad reputation. Nowadays, it never happens. All rabbis are perfect, I know. But in the times of the Talmud, sometimes rabbis did bad things. Um, Amar, that was a joke. Um, Amar of Yehuda, so Rabbi Yehuda asked his colleagues, hey, Chilabi, what are we supposed to do? The Shabbat, if we put him in, if we excommunicate him, hold on, but we need him, he knows things, he's very powerful, whatever it is, right? So we don't really want to excommunicate him. On the other hand, on the other hand, if we don't excommunicate him, that's really bad. It's going to be a desecration of the name of God, of the name of heaven. So uh, Rabbi Rabrachana says, um, I know something about this. This is what um, this is what Rabbi Yochanan said. My dichtiv ki sifte kohen yishmer that the Torah vakshul mitzvu. So it says in um, in Malachi in the book of Malachi, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Um, so im dome harav lemalach hashan yivakshul Torah mitzvu. If the if the master if the rabbi if the teacher is similar to an angel of god that's who you should learn torah from the im lav but if he is not i'll give extra torah with you then you should not learn torah from him okay so based on that teaching of rabbi yochanan brought down by rabbi barbara in conversation with rabbi huda sorry it's a little bit complicated <laughs> um based on that teaching rabbi huda said you're right we have to put this we have to excommunicate this guy Okay, but then what happens? They excommunicate him, but then Rav Yehuda, um, then Rav Yehuda gets sick and he's about to die, and all the rabbis come and they come to come to his bedside, and this guy who he excommunicated came with. Um, and when Kanchazi Rav Yehuda when Rav Yehuda saw him, he smiled, um, and the guy, the excommunicated rabbi, said, "Oh, okay, this stuff is amazing, but actually it's not so relevant. So we're gonna skip it. Um, sorry, just a taster. You have this." But you have the sources, you'll find them on your own. All right, Rabbi Yehuda dies, um, and um, and they all get together in the Beit Midrash. After the Beit Midrash, Amar uh, oh, so they're all in the Beit Midrash, and this excommunicated guy also comes into the Beit Midrash. And he says to them, Charlie, free me from my excommunication. I want to go back to teaching Torah. Um, let me go. Amar le Rabbanan, the rabbis say, Gavra, the chashiv, Rabbi Yehuda, leka hacha delishrelach. Hold on, there's no one here who's as important as Rav Yehuda who is around to free you from your excommunication. So go to Rav Yehuda Nesia, Zil Gaved Rav Yehuda Nesia, Lishrelach, and he'll, he'll, he'll free you. Azil Kameh, Amar Le Rav Yami, Fugai and Medina, and Rav Yehuda Nesia, well, there's too many names here, whatever. He said to his colleague Rav Yami, go, um, go look it up, go Fugai and Medina, and if, and if you think you we're allowed to free him, we'll free him. So Rabbi Ami does his research, he does his homework assignment, and he says, yeah, you know what, I've concluded, he says, I think we can let him go. Ahmad, here's the point. Sorry, that was a lot of people telling other people what to do. The point is, the guy who put him, just to recap, there's a rabbi they excommunicated by Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda died. Guy comes, excommunicated rabbi comes into the Midrash and says, "Please free me." And they say, "Hold on, we need someone of like really high stature to free you because you were excommunicated by someone of really high stature." So they send him to Rav Yehuda Nasia, who assigns his student to do like a research project about whether they can free him. And the, the student says, "Rav says, yeah, we should we should free him." Um, but then Rishmo Bar Nachmani stands up. Omar Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani Amar and says, Uma Shifcha shall bait Rebbe, the maidservant in the house of Rebbe. Lo nagu chachamim kalut rosh b'niduya shalosh shanim. Everyone was, took her excommunication extremely seriously. She excommunicated someone. The maidservant of Rabbi Yudanasi excommunicated somebody. And all the other rabbis treated her excommunication with authority for three years. Yehuda Haverinu, Yehuda, our colleague, Allahakabalakala, how much more so do we need to treat his excommunication with severity? So they want to free the excommunicated guy. 
And then Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani gets up on his feet and says, hold on, we have precedent for taking excommunications very seriously, for respecting them. We respected the excommunication that was put on by the maid servant of Rabbi Yudah Nasi. We respected that excommunication for three years. Don't we owe our colleague Rav Yehuda the same respect? Okay, so then whatever the story goes on. But the Gemara goes on eventually to ask, hold on, what is the story about the maid servant of Rav Yudah Nasi who put somebody into excommunication? So Shivcha shall be ready, my he. And the Gemara answers, the Amta de Bey Rabbi, Chazidi Lahau Gavra de Habe Mache with Noha Gadol. She saw a man um, beat his adult son. So, meaning a, a father is beating the son who is over 13 years old. Amra Lahau Gavra, Amra Lahebe Hau Gavra the Shah. She said, put this, uh, this the, the father into, excommunicate the father. The Ka'avar, because he violated the principle, the Ka'avar Mishu was very, very low keeping the soul, because he violated the prohibition on putting a stumbling block before the blind. Okay, let's pause for a second um, in order to understand what she's trying to say. So she's, she sees a, a, a father beating his adult son, and she says the father should be excommunicated for violating the prohibition of putting a stumbling block before the blind. So, what is the stumbling block here? If a child, if an adult child beats their father, that, that gets capital punishment. Um, and so if a father beats their adult child, the child's gonna wanna beat them back. The, the, child's gonna, the child is big, they're gonna wanna hit back, right? But the father beating their child, that's just like, um, whatever, that's not such a big deal. But, but, but if the child reciprocates, then immediately he, he that's a capital crime. So that's a really, so she's, her argument is that by the father beating the son, you're putting a stumbling block before the blind of the son. Does that make sense? I don't, I'm not sure I said that the most clearly I've ever done anything. <laughs> but basically the son's gonna wanna hit back and the son hitting the father is a capital crime, which is not the same as the father hitting the son. And that, that so it's putting a stumbling block in front of the son. And then a really amazing thing here happens, we won't finish this text and then we'll come off screen share for a second, um, which is we have an anonymous brighta, an anonymous teaching, which then says, What does the verse mean when it says not to put a stumbling block before the blind? The verse means not to, not to hit your adult children. All right, so I'm just gonna summarize what we just saw because it was a lot, but it was also crazy. Um, so what happens is we have a man who is excommunicated and they want to, uh, on the authority of a rabbi who has died and the authority of Rabbi Yehuda who died. And then they want to say, yeah, we can really release this guy from his excommunication. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, there's a clicking sound. Should I put in headphones? Is that right? Um, and the, hold on. Okay. Um, no, it's not better. It is not better. Well, we're definitely not going to do that then because that's annoying. Okay. I'm sorry about the hissing sound. I don't know what to do about it. Um, I'm just going to keep going because time is limited and I will work on that in my own time. Um, <laughs> okay. So we have a. All right. Rabbi Huda put someone in, to, excommunicated someone. The rabbis now want to let that excommunication go. And they say, oh wait, we can't do that because when the maidservant of Rabbi Judah the priest excommunicated someone, we respected her excommunication. And so therefore we have to respect Rabbi Huda's excommunication. That's like part one of our story vis-a-vis um, -vis her. So first of all, there's some amazing things. Like who's ever heard of a woman successfully excommunicating someone? That in and of itself is pretty awesome and rock stuff. But there's like this downside where the point where they say, oh, we have to respect this excommunication because we respected hers. That's like a little bit downer, right? They're like, oh, well, I'm a man, how much more so, right? It literally says, right? how much more so do we need to respect a man's excommunication? You, it says the language is Yehuda Chavirinu, him, our colleague, which makes it seem like her, not our colleague, right? So there's that complexity um, dynamic there. On the other hand, like, it's still really awesome. 
And then the story of her excommunication is also really cool for a few reasons. One is that it's like a really, like, it's not such a, like a straightforward, obvious teaching. Two is that she doesn't say it in someone else's name. It's not like she says, oh, I learned from my teacher this thing, or I learned from someone else. She kind of says it in her own name. And then what we have following that is in a not an unnamed Baraita, an unnamed source that says her exact same teaching, which you could read that in a few ways. You could just read it as, yeah, we know she's right because we have this unnamed source. Or you could say, who's the unnamed source? She's the unnamed source. And that opens up, this is just for fun, just for fun. There's no science behind this. But if you want to like live your Talmud study life in like a really fun way, every time there's an anonymous teaching, you can just assume it is written by a woman. Um, and it just like brings lots of women into the Talmud as you're reading. Um, as I said, just for fun. I, 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 there's no authority behind that. That is just a fun activity for your own Talmud study fun. Okay, um, but, but I do think that it at least hints at that here. Of, of this source being actually, yes, an original interpretation of a verse by her that not only gets preserved in an authoritative way, but actually got implemented in a way that's kind of really awesome and exciting. Um, even if they're going to say, oh, well, like, you know, she's less than Ravi Huda or whatever, but still, she, she excommunicated them. Really pretty bad. Okay. Um, next source, and, and this I think will kind of round out things here. All right, we're going to take this one a little bit slow. This is a really important source. I mean, all the sources we've looked at I think are really awesome and exciting and important. Um, but this one is really important for, um, comes up actually halakhically when we think about end of life issues, uh, which is funny. We don't normally look at Talmudic stories for um, halakha, though of course we sometimes do, um, but this one plays, plays really important, uh, a really important role in that. So I just wanted to kind of, um, kind of preface this with that. Okay, so here's the story. Oh, Yoma, the Nach Nach Sheikh the Rebbe, the day that Rebbe, again, or Rebbe Judah the Prince, died, Gashur Rabbanan Tanita Ovarachne. The rabbis decreed a fast and they were all praying. Um, and they said, anyone who comes with bad news about, um, about Rebbe's death will be stabbed with a sword. They really want Rebbe to stay alive. All right, so here's, here's what you're supposed to imagine. Slika ante de Rebbe, the Igra, so our heroine, the maid servant, she goes up onto the roof. Amra, and she says, El yonim mevakshim at Rebbe. The angels, the Im immortals, desire Rebbe to join them. And the rabbis here on earth want Rebbe to remain with them. Hear well that those below, those here praying for Rebbe to stay on earth, will overcome, overpower those above. So again, you have those above, those below, and her on the roof. And she, there's like a tug of war between those on high and those below, and she is the arbiter standing in the middle. And she has a say. So she says, you know what, here's what I want. But then what happens? She, here's what I want, I want Rebbe to stay. But then what happens, this is very important, and I want you to remember the first source that we learned together. Kivan de Chazai, Kama Zinne de Ayala Veda Kisei. Once she saw how many times Rebbe went to the bathroom, the chalats tefillin, and manach lehub, and the tzayar, and he would take off his tefillin, and he would put them back on, and he was suffering, he was suffering. Then what happens? Then Amra, and she sees all this, by the way, from her vantage point on the roof. And then she says, Yehiratzon sheyachufu elyonim et hatachtonim. May it be the will of the Almighty that the immortal, those above, overpower the mortal. But the rabbis below, they don't stop praying. They're praying and praying and praying. But she needs them to stop, or if Rebbe is going to leave this world, they need to stop praying for a second. And she knows this. So what does she do? What does she do? Um, Shakla Kuza, she takes a jar. Shadya Me'igra La'ara, she throws it from the roof to the ground. Ishtaku Me'rachmei. 
they stopped praying for a minute because she threw her, they, she threw this jar. Benach nafshe the Revi. And Revi died. All right. So that's a pretty amazing scene. Her intervention in the death of Revi is obviously really an outstanding moment. But where did she learn what to do in that moment? Meaning you have all of these other students who are Rebbe's students, who are standing outside of his house, praying for him to stay alive. And she disagrees with them. On what basis does she disagree? Where did she learn what the right approach was? Right? Many of us, when we're caring for other people in these late stages of life, we have to make very, very difficult decisions. And we have to make, sometimes have to make decisions based on some knowledge of what they would have wanted or ethics or right and wrong or whatever. But she acted with extraordinary confidence, meaning not only did she pray, but she actually took action. She actually intervened. Um, from where was that confidence? Do people want to throw into the chat some guesses about where she got this confidence from? Yeah, the weasels, the weasels. As a servant, she was more aware of the whole of him, whereas his disciples were more concerned with just his learning, his mind, his heart. Phyllis says, yes, to stop suffering. He taught her by the weasels that God is merciful and that we too are meant to behave with mercy and with compassion. And she originally said, no, of course I want him to live, right? But what changed it for her? She had this perspective. And I love, I love what, what the, the Braidman family here is saying, that she had this, she, had, she in general had a greater perspective on Revy. And she was noticing, because she's not just in it for the learning and the praying and the religious and the whatever, she's noticing how does he go to the bathroom, right? Because she has this more holistic perspective on him. And she learned from him that when you see somebody suffering, you're supposed to behave with compassion. And that's what she does. And she behaves with compassion against all of his other students, who are all saying, no, no, we want him to stay, we want him to stay, we want him to live. She says, no, a compassionate thing is to let him go. And she makes that happen by literally taking up a perch between the heavens and the earth and acting as an arbitrator, which is just not only does she have the power to, um, to put other humans in, 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 you know, to affect change amongst humans by um, excommunicating someone. She has way more than that. She has the power to even affect change uh, in matters of life and death in between humans and, 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 and those on high who, decide, who typically decide these things. Um, so it's really just a, a magnificent story. And, and when we see these stories all together kind of as a as painting a, a combined picture of her and her power amongst other people and her learning relationship with Rabbi Udanasi, who again, the Talmud just refers to as Rebbe. Like in the Talmud, he is like the rabbi. <laughs> um, and she is his, the student who answers the questions that none of his other students know how to answer, whether those are learning questions like, what does this word say Rugin mean? or care for their teacher questions and the human questions and ethics questions and kind of the biggest questions that, that even exist um, are questions, uh, are these questions of life and death. She seems to be the student who knows more and knows better than, than almost than any of them. Um, so is she ever named? Not exactly. There are like hints and there are places where it's, um, and, and some commentators give her give her a name, but um, the Tom, the Bible itself does not give her a name. Um, and wait, here's where I wanted to go with this, because um, when I was asked to give this year, I was asked to, to, really, to really make sure it's, um, to, to really talk about like Orthodox feminism a little bit. And so I, I started with this, but I, I, I want to tie it in now to what we've learned together, and then, and then I'll, I'll have maybe like 10 minutes or so with the questions also. Um, for me growing up, so I grew up in a co-ed um, Orthodox school at the Maimonides School in Boston or in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. And we always had the same teachers. We were in classes with boys and it was always the same. But one of the big questions for me was always like, I love these texts, but I never find myself in them. Like I can't, you know, there are women. Ilana Kershan in her book is All the Seas Were Ink writes about imagining herself into the Talmudic Beit Midrash, into, she can just imagine, like, I, I am a man fighting it out amongst the men. 
And that sort of works until, for me, where it really broke down was when I was learning the laws of Niga and hearing these rabbis talk and, or talk and write about menstruation. And it just becomes really clear that when you have a body that menstruates, like you are not one of them. <laughs> and that set me off on a search for um, finding myself here or finding the Talmud at least imagining how could it, how could someone like me come into existence? And that's what I think you really see here, meaning like what these texts are doing, are there, there are rabbis sitting around in Bava, like, I mean, there, there, there are traditions about this woman, surely. Are they true traditions? Did she ever exist? Maybe, but even, even if she existed, and even if the traditions are true, the way they're told, which is what we saw, I pointed that out in this first text, that they're told in this very Babylonian, she's as wealthy as King Shapur, the Babylonian king, who she certainly never would have met, right? They're told in this like Babylonian language with Babylonian references, because what it is, is these rabbis sitting around in the Babylonian uh, yeshiva environment, telling stories about this like mythological woman who was one of them. But if she's one of us, how does she fit in? And can she fit in? And is she always a little bit different? And but can but can we even imagine a woman who's as or more learned than the other rabbis around? And the answer to them was yes, we can imagine this woman. We can imagine a woman. And and there's a certain sadness to all of these texts. Like, what if we actually had let her into the door? What if her job weren't just saying, you're late, hurry up. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to teach you this word you've all been wondering about the whole time. But what if she was actually in there in the front giving the class? And these, these stories, I think, reveal a certain loss and a certain sadness that, sh that, that Talmud itself is, is feeling about her. Like, we know that she's this tremendous student. And did her teachings even get preserved? You know, like, it's fun. It's fun to read every anonymous statement in the Bible as being by a woman. But, like, how much did she know that never actually made its way into the Beit Midrash? And is this the Talmud, in a certain sense, like, mourning for that? And then, if the Talmud is mourning for that, then the Talmud is rejoicing today, right? Today, in a world where this classroom is full of women, and the, the doors of the Talmud Babli have been open to women, and we can find ourselves a home within it. And, um, and I think that, for me, is like a really important feeling to say that Talmud would have been happy. The Talmud imagined this world, couldn't quite imagine it, but dreamed about it, thought about it. And today we've made it, you know, many, many, it, a thousand and a half years later, we've made it the reality. Um, and how fortunate, how fortunate are we? Um, so that is, um, that's my talk. I keep it coming. I'm happy to stick around and take questions, both about these stories, about my experience learning Talmud in general as an Orthodox feminist, um, other random Orthodox feminist International Women's Day <laughs> thoughts and dreams you might have. Um, and um, either we can take things from the chat or people, I don't know, Julie is in charge of this, but she can unmute people who have questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Rabbi Nitzar. No, that was um, that was fantastic. And yeah, at this point, I think, um, I'm just gonna let people um, unmute themselves. So if folks have a question, feel free to, to jump in at this point. Um, I've answered all the questions. All the questions about Orthodox feminism and what it was basically you opened up, you opened up the possibilities to, the, to everything. Got to be some question. More classes like like these that bring out the invisible voices of the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Irene, great. So, thank you. No questions. All right. Um, in that case, I'm going to give another Melanie, half a minute for someone to jump in. Um, yeah, I'll ask, um, or actually just comment. So in the chat, um, Zoe Lang wrote, Rebbe's maid also seems more in touch with quotidian issues. She also was much more attuned to physical problems like when Rebbe is dying. When you were reading the text to us, I had that same impression. So even though 
they used this device of creating a maid who exists on the periphery and whatnot. Her role is very female and the things that she is, um, what she's doing and what she's responding to and her sensibilities and sensitivities, it's, it, it almost feels like it was written by a woman or inspired by a woman to, to have that touch as opposed to something that would just be a drier, more like a learning for the sake of learning kind of thing that we see in so many other places. Um, that's a really interesting perspective. Listen, I love those kinds of imaginative games. And that's why I'm like not a historian of the Talmud. I'm, I'm a rabbi because I love that type of thing. And I want to be in a profession where I'm allowed to do that. Um, and, um, and that's like one of the, one of the joys of my work is that I, I do want to like blow open all of those imaginative possibilities within the Talmud. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely, there's, there's definitely some of that. And as with any story, the reader makes a difference, right? So I, uh, for me, teaching is also performative, I don't know if you noticed. Um, and um, so there's a certain like gentleness in how you read the text, right? And, um, and, and that, um, that brings out like both the feminine elements of the text, but that also like it's feminine reader, i.e. me. Um, so, but yes, I think, I think you make a very beautiful point. Though I would, I, I do also at the same time want to say like things that we now identify so clearly as feminine or so clearly as masculine. Um, it's, we can't just impose those onto the trauma necessarily. I mean, we can if we're like doing it for fun, <laughs> but, 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 you know, like as um, there, there are, um, there are people who like their full-time jobs are kind of exploring like gender identities in um, in the Talmud and, and that's really really like fascinating and exciting um, work and and we did see exactly what you're saying that attention to like physical detail we actually saw that in a man in that first source right we saw his steward being that level of attentive to him um, also so you know it's complicated but but I definitely um, I definitely like that, appreciate the comment very much. I'll ask a question and maybe in the meantime, someone else will have one and then, and then we can wrap up. Uh, do you see any significance um, to the fact that the, the story of the stories of empathy that you opened up with had to do with animals, the weasels and the calf? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I do think that there's a lot of different, um, in all of these stories, there's a lot of different um, power levels going on. So we have like socioeconomics, right? She's not just a woman, she's a, a servant. She's like a lower class woman. And that's what's interesting if you're familiar with the stories about Yalta, who is this like very high class woman. Um, so we have, even amongst the, like, again, like six women in the, in the Bible, we see like socioeconomic differences amongst them that, that really play out in those, in those stories. Um, so there's that. And then, so you have gender, you have so, socioeconomic class, and then you also have, right, human versus not human. And what are our response? And then, so there's, what are our responsibilities towards people of, uh, of maybe like secondary or like lesser genders, people of lesser classes and people of lesser like levels of existence or something like that. I don't know exactly how to, how to say that like offhand correctly. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that those are, those are kind of, those questions are very like present in all these texts. So I do wonder whether like introducing animals says like, it's not just about like being kind to your maidservant. It's about then empowering your maidservant to be kind all the way down, all the way down the chain or something like that. I, I want to say how, how much I appreciate your teaching. And even more than that, I appreciate the joy that you take in teaching. Thank you. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. If you were out on the West Coast, I would take all your classes. Well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Arielle had a question. I did. Um, <clears throat> I, I was wondering what this... Uh, what does this specific story mean uh, mean for us as women, specifically? So for, 
Well, it's hard for me to speak for like us as women, but I'll speak for me as a woman. And then maybe you'll tell me what it says to you as a woman. Um, For me as a woman, it says that the Talmud could have imagined me. And that's very important because to me, that's very important (laughs) Um, because to me, that helps me feel like I have a place in this all. Like as a student of the Talmud, as someone who loves learning Talmud, never, a day does not go by where I do not open the Talmud. Um, It makes me feel like I'm welcome as myself. Like I don't have to dress up in masculine garb in order to enter its halls. Um, And that's very, to me, that that's, that's the beginning and the end of it. Um, That, that as myself, as a woman, um, I can, I can be part of the conversation and the Talmud can imagine that and the Talmud could mourn for its own loss that it didn't have that maybe. Um, And then this, this is, this is kind of how I ended, but that the Talmud, that, that, that the, the rabbis of the Talmud might have even been happy to have me learning what they're, what they're writing for a book that was, that was, again, that was not open to women studying it for most of its existence, right? And, and still today, there are many women who, who are not, many religious um, Orthodox women, though increasingly this is changing, and I see Michal Rasher is on here, and she spends a lot of time with ultra-Orthodox women, um, so she could probably tell us more, but my understanding is that even in the ultra-Orthodox community, women are more and more studying the Talmud, which is absolutely amazing, um, by, uh, but still, all of that is relatively new. Um, and so to feel like we're not just interlopers, but we're part of the inheritance is very important, in my opinion.